go to 2 Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter 3. Um, we'll start at verse 14 just to get the context. Uh, we are starting here, but just kind of getting the, the kind of a theme of what we're going to be looking at today just to finish off our series and dispensations. So, wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, such things as far as what he had been talking about previous, that the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, that he's going to destroy the earth with a fervent heat, and seeing that in the manner in which the Lord is going to destroy it, and the fact that he's coming very soon, uh, we should be living holy life, is, is what he's addressing. Okay, uh, this is kind of finalizing his, his letter to, to the believers, to the general public of believers. Uh, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. What he means by that is, in other words, God is sparing you uh, as far as if you're a believer, then you're being spared. We're not going to be destroyed as far as like the unbelievers would be, but in other words, he's sparing you um, from being able to, you know, I guess if you're not right with him, to he's sparing you so that you would get right. In other words, he's, he's rescuing you, he's giving you opportunity to be able to get right. And then for those that are already right, then obviously more. And then for those that would be unbelievers, now this is an address to unbelievers, this is addressed to believers, but in other words, he, he says, I count it as salvation. So in other words, it's not that it's being rescued from, from going to hell, but rather it's, it's, it's God's grace on your life, uh, the long suffering of the Lord. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. Now the idea of rest there is it's like twist. You are you're basically corrupting something, but you're twisting, you're perverting it. That's the idea of perversion. Actually, it's just like a twisting, a contorting. Uh, they uh, it they're trying to make it say or do something that it's not supposed to by nature. And as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. All right, so there are folks that are out there that rest scripture. Now, some do it out of maliciousness, out of just because they're allowing themselves to be guided, guided by Satan. And others are doing so, as it says here, that they are unstable and unlearned. So they're uneducated. They're not really knowledgeable in scripture either more than likely it's just because they haven't sought themselves to be educated in scripture and then also the fact that they're not stable they're not consistent in their walk they're not somebody that is committed to truth we know from not just uh, proverbs in particular but other portions of the scripture that if you seek wisdom uh, which it comes from god all wisdoms from god that he gives it to you he's one that is willing to give it to you liberally and he's not going to upbraid you for that. And also, if you have a heart to want to obey, then God is more than willing and ready to be able to go ahead and bestow his wisdom upon you and give you and bless you with, with all kind of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, but it's prerequisite to having a heart that is desirous and then also willing to obey what he's going to, what he's going to show. Now, having said that, um, there's three particular errors that we're going to look at with regard to what we've been talking about as far as dispensationalism. Uh, not that there is error in dispensationalism, but there's folks that would twist the teaching and then they would, as the Bible says here, they rest scripture and then they, uh, because of their unstableness and then their unlearnedness, uh, lead people astray. All right, so one of the first errors that we're going to be looking at is something called progressive dispensationalism. Now, mind you, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to present this, but most of this stuff is just, I can't relate to it. 
I'll, I'll just be honest with you. I was, I've come across some of this uh, simply because you will, from primarily from people that are Calvinists, and then others are just they're way off on kooky stuff. So then they, you want to know how to answer somebody whenever they come up to you and they address something that's like weird. Um, not, well, I, in other words, if they have, if there's a legitimate question and they're confused about something, then you want to be able to address it. So these are these are three, I guess, of the main more common errors, I guess you could say, that you would find of uh, people that take dispensational teaching or whatever and then just are, because of their, either they're unstable, they're unlearned, they, they twist scripture. So I'll, just as a caveat, I don't relate with the way of thinking of this, so this is a little different for me. I uh, try and put myself in somebody's shoes so that way I can better communicate to them. But um, a lot of this I can't really, I just can't relate to. I just don't see how it. Just logically, to me, it doesn't make sense. A lot of how where they come up, how they come, where they come from. All right, progressive dispensationalism. Um, the basic general idea is that there is an interrelationship or progression between the dispensations, and that uh, it's not really necessarily related to what would be progressive Christianity, which is the idea of more social social gospel. But the main thing with it, or the, the main issue with it, is that salvation was uh, progressive in the idea of like God progressively revealing himself. Uh, so his plan for salvation would have been progressive. So through the ages, uh, whenever you had if you go through the seven, because uh, they don't always necessarily break down with the with the seven, they have um, say when you you went from innocence into conscience. So now you have a system of worship. We see like even immediately into Genesis chapter four, where you had to have uh, had sacrificed uh, an animal, and I, I believe that would have been a lamb, because uh, we we see later on just God's character and, and how He instituted that with the law and that was always a consistent uh, uh, means of sacrifice so they would argue and they would put forth the fact that at that point in time then God instituted okay salvation would have been through uh, go ahead and killing this animal and then later on you would have had a priestly system uh, though it wasn't the Levitical priesthood that would later be instituted and then later because you see that with Abram in Abram's time, and even a little bit prior, that you had priests that were before God that offer sacrifices as well. So at some point there was a revelation from God saying, okay, you guys need to have a worship system where you have a priest, which is somebody that goes to God on behalf of people. And then later on he goes ahead and then he narrows it to being Levitical. And so now you have to have had somebody that comes from uh, the tribe of Levi, so then only somebody that is Jewish or would become Jewish is a person that would be eligible for salvation and they can only know God by means of the fact that you had to have sacrificed animals up until the time of Jesus and so forth and you can go on through like that and so that's how they would that they would call it uh, progressive dispensationalism so their their means of salvation would have been progressive it would have been God you know, little by little revealing more of himself and more of his salvation plan until ultimately Jesus came. Now the problem with that, uh, if you recall the chart that we handed out, the thing was, the that's very helpful because the layout of it shows that grace was available in every age and that if we go to Hebrews chapter 11, we see that as far back as Abel, that even though, yes, he sacrificed, the fact was that it was always by faith, and that salvation has always been by faith, uh, by grace through faith. And so God had never changed his means of salvation. And the folks back then, even as far back as coming from directly from out of the garden, looked to God by faith in what his promise was that he was going to send that seed that was going to crush the head of the serpent. 
uh, and that uh, his heel would be bruised, but his, his heel would crush the head of the serpent. And you look through the other instances of when God is narrowing his focus as far as how he's going to reveal himself or work through uh, somebody to, to the world, it's always been uh, the same means, and that is that he offered grace. He found people found grace. You know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, and so, and that was by faith. In in the, I won't say the best, but one of the best um, examples would have been Abram, even though that would have been a little bit further along in his plan. Abram believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And it talks about that again in Hebrews 11. Tying, all, tying in everything all in is that it wasn't the fact that, okay, he offered sacrifices. It wasn't the fact that he was going to raise his child uh, to, to follow God as God had clearly stated that he, you know, he had chosen him because he, he, he knew that he was a righteous man, he was a godly man, that he was, even though he was a sinner, he sinned <laughs> pretty egregiously, and uh, he wasn't necessarily like the best husband. Uh, but he, God counted him as righteous just because he believed him on his promise, and he was saved, and just the same as anybody. So grace was available, and salvation was always by the same means uh, through every age. Okay. Uh, the major difference between traditional and progressive dispensationalism, in addition to what we just stated, is in how each views the relationship of the present dispensation to the past and future dispensation. Uh, traditional dispensationalists perceive the present age of grace to be, or church age, uh, to be a parenthesis or an intercalation in God's plans. Uh, in general, the concept means God's revealed plans according, uh, concerning Israel from the previous dispensation has been put on hold until it resumes again after the rapture. Therefore, for traditional dispensationalists, the only relationship between dispensations is chronologically successive. Instead of viewing the present dispensation as a parenthesis, uh, progressives perceive the present age of grace as a vital link in God's uh, plan of redemption. Um, that's going to be something that's going to be coming up as well. Uh, as far as the church, how we fit into God's plan overall, and then to church's relationship to Israel. Uh, God had always had in mind for all people to be saved and for all people to come into the knowledge of Him. He wanted Israel to be the main vehicle. Now, when He presented Himself in His earthly ministry here to them, uh, they rejected him. We know that from, first, from not first John, from John one, where he talks about that uh, he came into his own, but his own received him not. And then, but as many as received him to them, gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So his presentation wasn't just limited simply just for the fact of salvation. Though that was his primary uh, purpose for coming the first time. But when he offered himself, he was actually legitimately offering himself as king though he would have to be cut off and he would have to die. Um, but the, the nation wholesale rejected him uh, because they weren't looking for Messiah to, to be cut off, even though prophecy was very clear on that, especially in Daniel 9. Uh, but other uh, Isaiah 53 and, and other, other portions of Scripture, uh, speaking of, of Messiah being cut off and that he would be uh, cut off for the sins of the people. I, you know, honestly, even Caiaphas, the high priest, prophesied that he declared that plainly. They knew, but they just rejected him. They weren't looking for their need uh, for their salvation, uh, their soul, but rather they were looking just for um, what many, many look for today, is just they want a better lifestyle. Or they were, in particular, they wanted obviously the, the restoration of the nation. Uh, but the truth is, if you come up in your standard of living, but you die and go to hell, what, you know, what have you gained? Mark and Luke and other portions of the gospel say it like this, basically, you know, what shall a prophet man if he gained the whole world, but he loses his own soul? Now, we know that's in context speaking to believers, 
talking about a wasted life, but still it applies to the unbelievers. And the fact is that you can gain the whole world, gain all the riches, but it's worthless with regard to your soul because there's no value, there's no comparison there. So, but they were they would have been looking towards that, and they uh, rejected Christ wholesale because they didn't see their need, or they saw themselves as being righteous already, not in need of a savior uh, for their sin. So, uh, okay, progressive dispensationalists perceive a closer relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant than do most traditional dispensationalists. One of the covenants which highlight the differences between the two is the New Covenant. In the past, dispensationalists have had a variety of views with regard to the New Covenant. Uh, okay, some dispensations, including uh, John Charles Ryrie and John Valver, uh, both of which have written a lot, a lot of good books. Now, Wal Valverd is a uh, former faculty with Dallas Theological Seminary. Um, he, at the time of when he was writing and he was still alive and publishing books, uh, wrote actually a really good commentary and a number of good books. The only problem I would have with it, primarily, you know, as far as um, in recommending and what you read, if, uh, like he's not King James, <laughs> okay. he's uh, he's NIV. Whenever whenever he writes anything or whatever he uh, so, but beyond that, for the most part, he's pretty solid as far as if you were to read any of his material, he's sound. Other than just the fact that he's not KJV, so all, all anything that he would have published would have been with with NIV. Uh, and then Ryrie. Um, I don't know. I, I know a little bit more about him. Uh, he is solid, and he's written. I wouldn't say the most about dispensationalism, but he has written a lot with regard to dispensationalism, just in general. If you want to know more, a little bit more thorough on the subject, he's got a specific book that is just committed to all that, and then he's got a, a theology book, uh, a systematic theology book that he wrote that he covers that in particular as well. Uh, and uh, I would I would recommend somebody gave it to me when I was a baby Christian in Hawaii to read and it really helped ground me to get me more stable as far as just what the Bible teaches. Uh, now what they do, uh, you probably thinking like, okay, why why does this matter? What's the big deal with this? Is that those are these are guys that just basically took the time to study out okay what the Bible says and then they just lay it out in a systematic fashion is all. That, that's all they did with it. It's like just a gathering, a collection of. Uh, essays or papers or whatever that they would have written on this subject or that subject and then they just put it together, compile it into a book and that's what it would be. And then systematic theology is just basically a systematic way of going through preachings about, okay, what does the Bible say about God? What does the Bible say about angels? What does the Bible say about salvation? What does the Bible say about this subject or that subject? That, that's what a lot of these guys did. Uh, okay, and then um, Okay, some dispensationalists, including Ryrie and Belver, in the 50s argued for two new covenants, one new for the church and another new for Israel. Others dispensationalists, including a gentleman by the name of J. Nelson Darby and John Master, argued for one new covenant applied only to Israel and still other dispensationalists, including Schofield and John McGehee in the 50s, have argued for one uh, covenant for a believing Israel today in an ongoing partial fulfillment and another new covenant for a future believing Israel when Jesus returns for a complete fulfillment. Um, okay, progressive dispensationalists argue for one new covenant with an ongoing and partial fulfillment and a future complete fulfillment for Israel. Progressives hold that the new covenant was inaugurated by Christ at the Last Supper. Uh, progressives hold that there are aspects of the new covenant currently being fulfilled uh, there is yet to be final and complete fulfillment of the new covenant in the future. Uh, this concept is referred to as an already but not yet fulfillment. Um, we would not differ too much on that. And what that is is just basically God's made promises to Israel. Um, what that is is the church is not Israel. Um, so when Christ told them that He's going to come and reign and rule. Now, we will be reigning and ruling with them, 
but he's going to he's going to physically go reign in Jerusalem. Uh, he's going to restore again to them the land. Uh, the only reason we would have any kind of promise to us with regard to land is because we are grafted in, and then according to Galatians, that we're joint heirs with Christ. Uh, in other words, Christ is not just our Savior, but He's, as far as God is concerned, our brother. And so Christ was also uh, of which tribe? Judah. Judah. Okay, so we would fall under what would be Judah's, just because of the grafting, because of the adoption, uh, we would fall under Judah's, whatever Judah's promise would have been given as far as their land plot. Um, but the land specifically was promised to Israel. And so God's not done with Israel. He didn't just say, okay, hey, I'm done with you. I'm replacing you with uh, as a uh, Covenant theologians like to teach with the church, and then so now all the promises that would have been to Israel are to be to us. Okay, that's that's not God's uh, plan. Uh, all right, so covenant theology, covenant theology. This is it says that it is a conceptual overview and interpretive framework for understanding the overall flow of the Bible. It uses a theological concept of a covenant as an organizing principle. For Christian theology, basically, it's from Augustine taking the Bible allegorically, and then also not just you want to go further back from Origen, teaching in Alexandria that the Bible could be interpreted uh, through allegorical means. It wasn't necessarily literal. Literal. Okay, the standard form of covenant theology views the history of God's dealings with mankind from creation to fall uh, to redemption to consummation. Okay, under the framework of three overarching theological covenants of redemption, works, and grace. Uh, these three covenants are called theological because they do not, though not explicitly presented as such in the Bible, they are thought of as theologically implicit, describing and summarizing the wealth of scriptural data. Uh, historical reform systems of thought treat classical covenant theology not merely, excuse me, not merely as a point of doctrine or as a central dogma, but as a structure by which the biblical text organizes itself. Um, okay, as a framework for biblical interpretation, covenant theology stands in contrast to dispensationalism and, re dispensationalism in regard to the relationship between the old covenant and the new covenant. Uh, in that. Um, the Old Covenant was with Israel and the New Covenant with the house of Israel, uh, Jeremiah 31, 31, in Christ's blood. So, in other words, when God established a New Covenant with Christ, then basically the Old was on a way, so his, his promises to Israel are no longer valid. So they, they replace, you know, those who would be believers in Christ with Israel. But we know from Romans 9, 10, and 11 that God's not through with Israel and that his promises to Israel still stand. So that's, don't, <laughs> I don't know any other way we put it. And I, I just, I can't relate to this. I don't understand. Because it, whatever, it doesn't make sense to me. But uh, Okay, that's such a framework exists, appears, at least feasible since the New Testament times. The Bible of Israel has been known as the Old Testament. Uh, okay, and then they would say as far as 2 Corinthians 3.14, they, speaking of the Jews, hear the reading of the Old Covenant in contrast to the Christian edition, which has become known as the uh, New Testament or Covenant. So, basically, it's a replacement, one for the other. And so we don't subscribe to that because if you were to read your Bible clearly, you would understand that God's not through with Israel. He hasn't set him, he set him aside temporarily, but he's not 
completely done away and he hasn't taken away their promises to them. Right. Uh, there is a partial fulfillment to them, but there is yet still pending much to be fulfilled uh, that will be uh, once we're taken up. And we will be witnesses to that. We actually will be partakers to some degree because of the adoption and being grafted in. Okay, But it wasn't explicitly, specifically given to us. It was specifically, explicitly given to them. And then what God is doing is he's making of the two, one new man, together. And so that's, it's, it's going to be a beautiful thing down the road. Well, it's a beautiful thing now. <laughs> okay. We have salvation. Uh, all right. Next, we'll look at ultra dispensationalism, which is another silly thing, I think. All right. The grace movement or hyper dispensationalism, mid acts dispensationalism. Um, is a Protestant conservative evangelical movement that values biblical inerrancy and literal hermeneutic. Okay, they specifically view the teachings of the Apostle Paul both as unique from early apostles and the foundation and, uh, and as foundational for the church. Okay, uh, Paul's status is a result of having been commissioned as the apostle to the Gentiles and then personally taught by the risen and glorified Lord of Heaven. Um, now. Where they would differ is they, they would say that only moving forward from what Paul's teachings are, what are relevant for us today, because that is um, God's, God's plan for, for us today, just to summarize. Uh, they would say that anything previous is no longer really valid because God's working a new thing, a new work, and that is through... Paul in particular, uh, and so we, we, we don't even look to Christ necessarily, we look to Paul's writings, even though they might not want to explicitly try to denounce or deny Christ. Um, here's some the only problem with that view is primarily that you have the fact that in First Corinthians we're told that these things were written aforetime uh, for our learning and admonition that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. In other words, God's plan is to, or and also that we should let me <laughs> let me uh, let me go back to First Corinthians chapter ten. First Corinthians ten. Uh, verse 6, for 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Um, then it talks about me to be idolaters. But the things that are written aforetime, and then also 1 Corinthians, if you wanted to, verse 16, and you wanted to look through, we could go through in Second Peter chapter 3 where he spoke of Paul's writings as being scripture and then other portions of scripture the thing is you look to that and you also look to the Old Testament as being not only is it inspired but it's still relevant to us even though we would be in a different time and age because the fact is it's written for us <laughs> so that as in Second Timothy it tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable okay so all of it not just a limited portion of it, not just Paul's writings of it, but the whole thing is profitable for us. And it's uh, for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, you know, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. In other words, God's plan and intent for us is that scripture, all of it, is to be used and is gainful and is necessary for us to be able to grow and become what we need to be in Christ. All right. Um, just wanted to cover those only because we might encounter some of that. And then um, also the fact is that there are unstable and unlearned people that twist scripture. And you could probably go through and find all kind of weird twistings and perversions of T 
teaching in scripture that are very plain and basic. Uh, if you were just have an open heart to want to learn, have an open heart that says, okay, Lord, I want to obey what you're going to teach me. And then you're, you're sincerely, genuinely seeking truth um, that God will instruct us in. Um, one, does anybody have any questions? I know I just seem kind of like a little random and scattered. But does anybody have any questions? Yes. Yeah, well, um, going back to what you were talking about with the covenant, with uh, covenant theology, were you basic, when you were talking about that, were you basically saying it was comparable to what um, some churches teach as far as like a replacement theology, or is that, or how does that differ? I think, no, that, uh, maybe if you were. That would be, yeah, that's basically. What, Same thing? Yeah. That, some people would might argue a little different points, but it's basically it's the uh, but the, the, the gist same. of it is the same. Okay. Yeah. Because it what they're saying is the old covenant's with Israel, but the new covenant is with the true Israel of God, which is those who are saved by faith in Christ. So in other words, God did away with Israel. <laughs> Okay, that's that's basically what it comes out yeah, to. Which, which but you can't. I mean, any way you look at it, that's like okay, yeah. Did I answer your question? That's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um. Again, these are just certain. We're just fishing out. <laughs> these are certain ways that people twist uh, the scripture, and these are certain ways that people, because they're unlearned and unstable want to go ahead and cause you to doubt your faith or want you to come. Basically, they're going to lead you astray. Uh, the cure for that is just be in the Word of God. Uh, not just study diligently, but also have a heart that says, Lord, I want to learn, and I also i am going to be obedient to what you show me, what you teach me. Those are God's prerequisites, basically, for our being able to be taught, to be instructed, to be grounded, to grow. All right, so next week we are going to, or this coming week, I should say, next few weeks we're going to be looking at uh, the issue of biblical manhood, biblical womanhood. Uh, we're going to be addressing in that uh, the whole controversy of uh, gender confusion. Is there any kind of legitimacy to that? Some people would want to argue that uh, genetically, you know, some people aren't really... Uh, male, if they're born male, and likewise they would, vice versa, they would say that okay, some people that are female they're born female, but they're really not and, and we're going to address some of those things as well and then just what the Bible has to say about it uh, so, no more questions or no questions right, so we're dismissed it's a little early, I know Charlie? Yes. How are you? Good, I already can see it. Nice to see you. Good morning, morning. morning kids.